for this, and I'm going to introduce our moderator for this last panel, Sean Corsandi, who's a member of our Board of Advisors. Sean. Thank you, Frampton, and thank you everyone for sticking with us for our final panel today. It's a cheerful one, preserving memorials and sites of trauma. So uh, we'll have a lot of content to cover. Uh, and I might be the best or the worst person to discuss this because coming or hailing from the Upper West Side, we've had two key memorials that were meant to be positive uh, in their day when they were installed that have had uh, various lifespans since, especially just during COVID. Uh, during the daily briefings, when former mayor, former governor Cuomo was healing us <laughs> or keeping us sane uh, day to day, he also managed to get the Christopher Columbus rostral column uh, designated and protected at the state level. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the Museum of Natural History was reevaluating their Teddy Roosevelt statue, which has now been relocated to North Dakota. So two things that were meant to be uh, uplifting and supportive and honoring something had very different takes uh, through modern day or learned trauma. Uh, so we have three speakers today. And the first one is Juan Aguirre. He has a bachelor's of science from St. John's University. And he's been an advocate for Mexican culture and art with a background in public service and nonprofit management. He's currently the executive director of a group called Mano a Mano, Mexican Culture Without Borders. And today he's gonna to share some projects in response to COVID and then honoring the days of the dead. Juan. Uh, thank you, Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, today, as uh, Sean said, I'm gonna be speaking about um, two, two projects, but the first is um, naming the lost memorials. And naming the lost memorials is a small team of artists, activists, folklorists that has been uh, creating memorial sites in your city to name and remember victims of COVID-19 since 2020. Uh, in 2020, several friends and um, got together and decided that they wanted to, uh, to remember those that were dying. I, if you can remember back then, there were about a thousand people dying a day of COVID. And so uh, it was a very traumatic time, very hard for uh, many people because they were not able to see their loved ones. Uh, as you may remember, there was uh, cremation was encouraged. Uh, there were no funerals. And so we all got together and, and decided um, we wanted to remember them, even if it was just for, uh, for a short time. Uh, after this grassroots uh, acti um, activities continued throughout almost two years, the Mellon Foundation announced an award um, to under their grants, uh, under their um, memorials project to continue this effort for three additional years. And so um, the one of the things that we, we did was to get together and uh, working with Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, uh, we used their fence to put up these memorials. And so um, this this actually, this, a lot of these pictures I'm gonna show you uh, are from, from about, uh, about a week ago actually last week. Um, and one of the other things that we did was uh, by putting up the memorial, we also wanted to activate the space. And this image is of course of uh, a group that participated in creating one of the panels of the memorial. Uh, we had 20 groups from all over New York City and they were also invited to perform, uh, to recite poems and to talk about, um, about their experiences. And so the, the memorials are, very, um, you know, they're, they're there for a short time. And so we put up a, a, a net on the fence and then we encourage people to add their, the names of those that passed away uh, and create art around it. Um, and so a lot of people have participated. Uh, we have done these memorials. We did them all over New York City. Um, this is just an example of one of them. Uh, and you know, we added naming the lost as the name of the memorials. Um, 
And then that was translated into other languages, into Spanish, nombrando a los fallecidos, and then um, Mandarin and, and Arabic and other languages. And, and then the other thing that we did uh, in 2021 was to kind of pair and marry uh, naming the lost memorials with the celebration of Day of the Dead. Uh, as you may know, uh, Day of the Dead is a time for uh, where, where we remember our family members uh, and, and friends and ancestors that have passed away and we create uh, memorials, the structures uh, or small monuments that, um, that last about a week or two. And in these, uh, we call them ofrendas or offerings. Uh, here in the US, people call them altars. And these are created to remember people who have passed away. And so we, we thought that if we do it together with naming the lost, uh, we can encourage people to participate in the, in the ofrenda or the, uh, or the altar. But in, in 2020, which this is a picture from, uh, you know, gathering was an issue. We, we couldn't gather um, more than 20 people. And so we decided that we wanted to do instead of, so ofrendas and altars are always uh, inside the homes of people, but in New York City, because of, um, because of the way that the city works, we, decided we, we do these uh, ofrendas outside uh, in a space where the public can gather and celebrate. But in 2020, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't possible. So we decided to turn the ofrendas and do uh, an installation on a, um, on a window, kind of like a shopping mall. And the idea was that people who passed by, if they wanted to contribute, they could. Um, they would just needed to let us know. There was a table and we added uh, information there. But from the outside, people would look in uh, as opposed to coming inside a space for, this, um, for these memorials. Um, and then we created this, this is at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, and that's where our celebration of Day of the Dead has been uh, happening for the last 18 years. Uh, so we talked with the, with the priest in charge, and we wanted to do uh, a fence memorial. Um, in this case, because it was during Day of the Dead, we, we took part of a uh, Mexican celebration where um, in Mexico, and for those of you who are familiar with the dead, we use a lot of skulls. Um, and what, one of the, the idea of the skulls, it really dates back for many, many years. Uh, it's pre-conquest, pre-Hispanic. Um, but during the conquest, some of the um, Catholic elements of uh, the tradition of uh, All Souls Day were married with the, the pre-Hispanic celebration of the, the dead. And one of them was the use of skulls and, um, and naming the skulls. So we created uh, these skulls and, and gave them out to people. People paint them, uh, they colored them, and they added the names of people uh, on the forehead, which is um, the, the tradition. And, and this was on display for about 30 days. Obviously, with this type of memorials, uh, naming the lost and the, this one for Day of the Dead, um, because they're on a fence, you can imagine the weather. Um, people who pass by also um, may, especially in 2020 and 2021, with a lot of the political um, topics that you know people were against vaccines and, and things like that. There were a few, especially this one that we did at St. Mark's, uh, somebody ripped it up. Uh, Two days before we took it down, but um, but the idea of uh, naming the lost is really to come together and remember those who have died. And what something that came out out of some of the first events that that we did is that people uh, shout out the names of those that have passed away of COVID, and that's how you know the the, the project became naming the lost. So people would say naming the lost, and then someone would say the name of the person who has passed away. Uh, Thanks to the, the, Mellon the Mellon Foundation and the grant that the group received, um, part of the murals that we create or the, um, the memorials, they're going to be uh, uh, selected and they're going to be uh, housed at the New York Historical Society for preservation. Um, and this is something that uh, it's, it's very important to us because a lot of the, the things that people uh, create um, and, and put on, on, these, on, the, on the fences. Um, a lot of people tell us that it's, it helps them 
bring closure. Uh, when we activate these memorials, it's a very emotional time. A lot of people get together, family, friends, and, and one person just said this last week, uh, said to me that they couldn't have a funeral for a family member, but the event that we did kind of replaced that funeral. And so I think when someone passes away, it's important to celebrate their life by honoring them. And these, these memorials um, are, are doing that right now uh, for those that were not able to, to, uh, to remember their loved ones or to celebrate them when they passed away. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Bring it up when we when you come up. Uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, my next our next speaker is Emmanuel Oni. Uh, Oni has a dual degree, a dual bachelor's in biology and psychology from the University of Houston, and a master's of architecture from the Parsons School of Design. A first night generation Nigerian American artist, he's the former director of community design at the New York City Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice. He is the co-founder of and creative director of a nonprofit, Liminal, and he teaches at Parsons currently. He's going to share his work in the area of spatial justice and in Reclaiming Space for Healing. Oni? Okay. Hmm. Where's the... Okay. All right. Um, howdy, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Oni. Oh, wow. Y'all responded. That was cool. Um, so I know I've had a, a limited amount of time, and I know everyone's been here for a while. So uh, I'll kind of jump right into it. Um, so just to start off, uh, there's this common sort of idea that I've had for a while. Um, and at its core, I realized um, that every space has a frequency. And so my work has pretty much been predicated on this idea that loss disrupts an energy in a space and that this unease or tension is due to uh, the spirit or the experience being unresolved. And so that's how uh, my project Beyond Memorial sort of uh, builds off from and, and the themes that I'm sort of working in. And a lot of my past work as well has also been on uh, surrounded with these sort of ideas. Uh, and so in this case, uh, for instance, uh, an anger releasing room that I co-created with the Brownsville Community Justice Center, where the youth were able to create this room to allow community members to release anger and any kind of emotions uh, in the, on this like mobile space. And then another project, a very low scale, low budget one, but uh, I feel like had a lot of impact working with the Brownsville community um, not Brownsville community, but the Brownsville Think Tank Matters group in redesigning their mobile trauma unit into a, a, a mobile healing space. And so it was actually in this ride along uh, with them that I talked with the grief recovery counselor. Um, his name is Reverend Shannon. Uh, and we basically you know, went around the neighborhood looking at different spaces around um, Brownsville and just noticing uh, spaces like this uh, where some kind of violent incident took place and afterwards, there'd be some kind of candlelight memorial uh, or march that took place right after. But eventually, over time, these uh, candles went away. Um, but there's still these negative perceptions and, and um, sort of stigma surrounding the space. And it, it created this perception of the space to be unsafe. And so passing by, you could always feel that shift in, in the energy change. And it made me think to myself, you know, what, what can we do uh, differently in moving beyond um, these sort of conventional memorials? And so that's how Beyond Memorial sort of took shape and it became this um, art, spatial healing justice response to these invisible yet palpable scars left in spaces of loss or gun violence. 
So fortunately, um, at the time I was working with the mayor's office of criminal justice, um, and I was connected with a community group, um, a community organizer uh, who was a mother who lost her son to gun violence at a particular street intersection in Bushwick. Um, and so basically she wanted to memorialize her son's passing at that intersection, but the community board uh, denied her request to do so. And so she came to me basically saying, um, you know, I'd like to be your guinea pig in this sort of beyond memorial process. Uh, so I'll actually share a little bit of a video uh, to introduce you to her. I hope the volume's working. Akil Christopher's favorite color was purple. He is remembered for being a promising, bright young teenager who unfortunately lost his life due to gun violence at this street corner. He was a son of Natasha Christopher, once Bushwick resident and now community leader working with the God Squad in 67th Precinct. This corridor is also known to have other fatal incidents and due to the poor lighting conditions makes the area feel unsafe to walk through at night. Natasha is advocating for safer passages for youth, not only to commemorate her son's life, but to also make newly gentrifying residents aware of the history of this site. If I can come here and it looks different, you know, I don't want to like, you know, when I was coming out the taxi, I almost didn't come out. I didn't want to come out because the first thing, it's the space that took my son's life. You know? So that's for me, it's just reimagining re it. And if we can do that, you know, it will, you know, it will make me feel a little better. It's not going to give me back my son, but it will make me feel much better. So whatever we can do to, you know, to change it, right? We are asking people to support us in this cause, as we'd like to build on this idea in multiple public spaces across the city, and to aid in the healing process and reclaiming of space for families like Natasha. I'm also now having some technical difficulties in getting back. <laughs> oh, there it is. And so after a few sidewalks with um, Natasha, I, I can, I know how to do it. I think I can, cool. Up here, right? I think it was up here, okay. Um, and so after a few sidewalks with Natasha, um, she talked, we just had a conversation about her son uh, and his life. Uh, and one of the things that pointed out from those conversations is that she said that his favorite color was purple and that when she laid him to rest, uh, he was buried in a purple suit. And with that said, we decided to use that color as a way of highlighting that space and that we would use the light post to kind of carry on that candlelit theme, but it's something that's uh, not as easily removed. Um, and so at night, ideally that this would not just be a sort of a daytime memorial, but that it would be dynamic and that night there'd be some kind of purple light or glow that kind of disrupts that space. So when people pass by, people are aware of what happened um, in that site. And then also sort of adding this kind of QR link where people can find out more information about Akil and other advocacy efforts towards this cause. And so this is uh, sort of the results of that, uh, of this installation. It was more of a prototype. Um, I ideally wanted to cover the entire um, light post, 
But of course, that would take up oh, hold on. five minutes. Okay, cool. That would take up a, a, a lot of uh, time getting approvals. And so I wanted also something that the community, if they wanted to do it themselves, that they could actually sort of do this kind of work. Uh, and so again, Natasha's um, response to this was that after she experienced this, this unveiling that the, the space actually felt different. Um, so that was one key sort of takeaway. And that's when I realized there probably could be some sort of framework around this or methodology to this process. And I'll kind of rush through this process because I wanna um, share with y'all uh, the, uh, the youth group that I worked with and kind of show a video about that. So I kind of call this Beyond Memorial Part Two, uh, where basically I worked with uh, the Brownsville Community Justice Center again with their, uh, what's the name of their? Keep, peacekeeping, yeah, it's their peacekeeping youth group. And basically they're trained in community peace, uh, peacekeeping efforts and uh, do a lot of advocacy, advocacy for safer passages in their neighborhood. And so working with them, we were charged with uh, reclaiming several sites. Um, and then we also noted that it, it didn't have to be a site where, where life was lost, but it could also be a site where it was a loss of space. Uh, and so that process was sort of broken down into three different um, phases, the first part being remembrance, where we did this, um, this sort of sidewalk series using a, a game called Space Bingo. Um, the groups went around the neighborhood and sort of talked with different community members and took photographs uh, of them and just got everyone's sort of uh, perceptions of different spaces. They then did uh, sort of a community map afterwards and presented that uh, with each other to sort of discuss the different observations that they've had. Um, the next phase was a reimagination where it involved a lot of ideation sessions. We also went on a field trip to the African burial ground gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, and used tools like Canva to um, document um, their, their, those stories and their observations and um, their experiences throughout. Um, and so lastly was the resistance part. And so that's what I'd like to share with you all now. They basically did this uh, sacred sites tour with a lot of community members. Um, and other uh, creative guests that were part of the, um, the this Beyond Memorial Part Two process. So I'll share that video now. The first site we selected is on Junior Street between Belmont and Pickin Avenue. We chose this area because we felt like it was an underutilized space, and it looks like there's an abandoned building. We learned in one of our history sessions that Brownsville used to have a Pickin movie theater, the Lowe's Pickin movie theater. It opened on November 23rd, 1929, and it could seat over 2,800 people. It was closed, unfortunately, in 1971 due to the neighborhood declining. What if we could make this movie theater or block that shows outdoor movies? We made the light pole color yellow to represent popcorn and passed out popcorn on our tour, a subtle homage to the theater experience. chose Rockway Avenue stop to reclaim because it feels unsafe here. It is also needed for transportation. In our history workshop, we saw a really old picture of the same station. It hasn't changed for over 100 years, and it opened in November 1920. Some history of the site is that Rockway is named after the Reco Wacky tribe of indigenous people that used to live here before they were displaced by the Dutch. Reco Wacky means lonely place or place of water sprite. We made the light poles blue to represent the area's connection with water and the flow of people using the train. It's like a river. We would like to baptize the space with water. For our tour, we brought a bubble machine to fill the space with water for our ritual. chose Dr. Green Playground as an unsafe and underutilized space because nothing really happens here. It's also known to have a lot of violence taking place. Back in the day, I used to come here and play basketball as a child. We decided to mark the space green for the playground. 
We talked with an ice cream lady down the block one day, and she talked about all the games the kids used to play. One of the games that we used to play was Skelly. We demonstrated this game during our site tour as a form of ritual to recreate the experience for our guests. Kids don't know nothing about today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do y'all know? Spelling. Yeah. So we play like, play like, really play. And these kids out here, mm. you know, these kids down there, all they got to do is shoot. Oh, that's good. You know, so that was like my best moments of growing up out here, actually being a kid. Mm. And then the other best thing was getting out of here. <laughs> One of my favorite experiences is creating the skelly on the sidewalk because one, I did it and it just made the community, well, the old folks, you know, reminisce about the old days of how the kids would come outside and play skelly and not pick up a gun and, you know, cause violence. One of my favorite games to play. So, for you guys to even bring this back, it's crazy. Like, you know, it connects us. And one of the games that we played was Skelly. And so I want to say two things. One, thank y'all for this. Secondly, this was the park where I held my first memorial glory in this park. So it's all connected. So thank y'all for even identifying this space. Thank you, Oni. Just gonna pull up the last presentation. So today, Gina Pilar is our closer. Uh, Gina has a BA from Bennington College and a BARC from the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Uh, she's accomplished doer and has served as interim COO for the Wrightwood 659, uh, an exhibition space by Tadao Ando at Lincoln Park. It's in Chicago, for those of you. Um, and has previously been the executive director at the Franklin D. Roosevelt for Freedoms Park. Today, she runs her own project management and strateg strategic planning consultancy. Uh, today, she's going to share her work with Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition. Gina. The one that is, is advanced back. Okay. Nope. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I want to just share quickly with you uh, a little bit of the history of the fire. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, know a lot about the Triangle Fire that took place in 1911, but that is the impetus for the Triangle Fire Memorial that I've been working with the coalition on since about 2018. They've been at it a lot longer than I have. And when we talk about uh, how long it takes to build a memorial, 
This one's going to be uh, over 100 years after the fact. So um, the building still exists. Um, did I get that right? Nope. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, it is at the corner of Washington Place and Green Street, one block east of Washington Square Park. The Triangle Factory fire uh, occupied the top three floors of this 10-story building. It now belongs to NYU, and they call it the Brown Building. It's their biology and chemistry labs. Um, and I just want to point out the uh, signs that are hanging off the corner of the building because I'll reference those later. I keep pushing the wrong button, sorry. Uh, this is not the interior of the Triangle Factory, um, but shirt waists were made in factories like these. Um, at this time, this was considered a modern factory, even though these very cramped conditions uh, were used to maximize the floor space. There were long tables with no breaks in between them for circulation. So in order to get out, you had to walk down that long row. Uh, people worked 16, uh, six days a week for 12 to 16 hours a day. So you might want to know, what is a shirt waist? Or a waist, as it's referred to in the advertisement, is essentially a woman's blouse. Uh, up until the time it was invented in the uh, 1890s, women wore a single garment. They wore a dress. Um, and the shirt waist was uh, inexpensive, and it became the symbol of independent working women. At the turn of the century, production was hyper competitive. In Manhattan alone, there were 450 factories employing 40,000 garment workers. The Triangle Factory was the largest manufacturer of shirt waists. At their busiest, there could be 1,000 workers a day. Um, on the day of the fire, there was about 500. I keep going backwards. Sorry about this. Okay, here we go. Uh, so the factory fire took place on March 25th, 1911. The fire broke out at about 440 on a Saturday afternoon. Um, no one knows the exact cause of the fire, but it is thought to be started in a scrap bin on the eighth floor by a discarded match or cigarette. Since most of the women didn't smoke at that time, it's likely that it was a man who caused the fire. Um, one of the members of the coalition believes it was his grandfather who started the fire. Yeah. When the fire broke out, the eighth floor, it broke out of the eighth floor, the eighth floor called the 10th floor, which was where the owner's offices were. But no one thought to call the ninth floor. The people on the 10th floor escaped. On the ninth floor is where most died. The fire spread very quickly. Shirtwaists were made of cotton or linen, and a lot of highly combustible dust was created during the manufacturing process. So the door to the stair on this floor was locked because the owners wanted to prevent thefts of scraps of fabric. In fact, the workers had to open their purses and turn out their pockets before they left every day. But the doors were also locked to prevent union organizers from coming in and also to stop spontaneous walkouts. Many escaped by the Washington Street elevators. The fire escape, which was undersized, keep doing that, um, was collapsed under the weight. This is a photograph of the mangled fire escape. Two dozen workers died when it collapsed under the weight of too many bodies. Fire trucks raced to the scene, but the ladders could only reach the sixth floor. So the firemen set up nets in hopes of catching the people who were jumping out of the windows. There were two heroic men that operated the elevators and they rescued as many people as they could until the fire made it impossible for them to make any trips. Another member of the coalition um, had two great aunts in the fire, uh, Rosie Weiner and Katie Weiner. One of them died and one of them lived. And Katie was the last one that grabbed the cable of the elevator on its last trip and actually made it out. Um, the fact, uh, so they, um, I'm still doing this wrong here. Okay, the factory was destroyed. But these are actually the witnesses to the fire that day saw these young women jumping out of the ninth floor window crashing into the sidewalk, crashing through those nets that the firemen had set up. In fact, 
some of them crashed through the sidewalks that had those lights in them because these, are, these were vaulted sidewalks. Um, so this is the picture of the factory after the fact. Um, bodies were taken to what is called what was called the Charities Pier at the 26th Street. Uh, 26th Street in the East River. And there the families had to search for their person and sometimes identifying only them, only identifying them by a ribbon or a shoelace or a shoe. And following the fire, there was a tremendous outpouring of grief. There were multiple funeral pro processions, especially in lower Manhattan and, and all of the mourners just kept crisscrossing paths. On April 5th, 1911, there was a funeral procession for the unidentified dead. More than 100,000 workers participated and as many as 400,000 spectators stood in the rain to bear witness. The owners were charged with manslaughter and acquitted. New York State created the Factory Investigating Committee. Frances Perkins, uh, seen here with Eleanor Roosevelt on the right, was a member. She had witnessed the fire and could never forget it. She became the first women, woman secretary of labor under President Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and she said that that was the day the New Deal was born. As a result of the fire, New York City and New York State led the nation in passing laws uh, to keep workers safe. Among them, sprinklers, stricter requirements for fire escapes, alarms, exit, private. okay, so I gotta hurry because I'm down to five minutes. So in uh, the Rana Plaza disaster, they are also paying homage to the Triangle Fire. So in 2013, the Remember the Fire Triangle Coalition held an international design competition. They chose a design by Richard June Yu and Ori Wegman called Reframing the Sky. This is looking at the corner of the building um, it is basically a ribbon that descends from the windowsill of the ninth floor where most of the women jumped. It cascades down the corner. It splits into two horizontals on the east and uh, south facade of the building. It wraps around until it becomes a reflective panel at hip height. So the ribbon, not only does it refer to the needle trades, but it also makes reference to uh, the kind of uh, ribbons and bunting that, is, that are hung on um, buildings to during times of public mourning. Uh, and the ribbon also makes references to the signs that were at the corner of the building. So here's a view looking at that corner, seeing the ribbon descending and splitting into those two horizontal panels. Here's the view that you would see as a spectator. So when you see the a panel that appears above this person's head, laser cut into that panel are all the names and ages of the 146 victims. So there were two thirds were Jewish, a third were Italian. Uh, there were mostly young women and girls, immigrants, and there were some of them as young as 14 years old. On the reflective panel, the lower panel that you see, there will be a line of text that gives um, excerpts of what people said as they witnessed the fire. We had, uh, the designers wanted to um, respond to the current sort of conversation around, you know, who makes a memorial, who decides what a memorial is. And so they incorporated this idea of what they call the collective ribbon. So they laid out on tables long ribbons of muslin, and they had uh, invited all, there was a public participation event, they invited people to bring a piece of fabric and to sew it onto these ribbons, then that texture of the ribbon will be, uh, is digitally uh, scanned and then it will be etched into the fat in, into the surface of the ribbon itself. And what's interesting when we compared the photographs of the ribbon workshop and the factory workers, there was quite a resemblance between the two of those. Here again is a view looking up the corner uh, and another view looking from the side. We were up at the uh, fabricators on Wednesday. We see all of the name panels have now been fabricated. You can see the um, uh, etched pattern of those collective ribbons. And this is kind of what you will see when you look down into the reflective panel. You will see both that text and the um, names laser cut. Now, what, 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 one of the astonishing things when you, sometimes when you create things, you don't anticipate every single thing. And we had done a full-scale mock-up on the site. You know, what you would see when you look down. 
into the panel. And what's interesting about this is because you're looking down, it's also provoking you to look up at the name. So you're looking down, you're looking up, you're looking down, you're looking up, which is kind of an eerie um, replication of what people were doing that day as they watched women jump out the window. And the other astonishing thing was we set up this mock-up and it uh, storm blew in that night. And these are the, the clouds from the storm, which uncannily uh, recall the smoke from the fire. So I'm happy to say that we are on target to dedicate, uh, this will be affixed to the building obviously, and we're gonna dedicate it this October on the 11th. So mark your calendars. Thank you. On and Oni one more time. Thanks, everyone. There's a lot of uh, thought-provoking proposals here, and again, memorizing, memorializing things that creating a memory for things in some cases that we're just learning about or learning about, um, which is an interesting concept. So we're allowed two questions according to. <laughs> um, does anybody? Yeah, we already have one. Please. Um, they participated in the competition that was held in 2013. So that was kind of the conversations were started a little bit before then because the coalition um, was established to celebrate the 100th anniversary. And so the talk of doing a memorial really, you know, it's been proposed many, many times before, but there are three plaques on the building and no one ever sees them because they're just, you know, who reads a plaque these days. And in fairness, NYU's only owned the building since 1929. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else? Please. Um, this is uh, more of a comment, but in addition to Francis Perkins mm -hmm. witnessing the fire and then becoming the first woman to be in a cabinet and becoming the mother of Social Security and workman's comp and unemployment compensation and the CCC, she was asked to take the job at Roosevelt House. Yeah, that's right, I forgot. One of the people who memorialized the workers um, was a woman named Rose Schneiderman, who was about this tall. And she spoke um, at one of the big memorial services, I think at Town Hall. And she was the leader of the Women's Trade Union League. Eleanor became a member of that in the 1920s. And Rose educated her and Franklin about labor issues. So there are all these connections. So it was a horrible event, but it triggered all of this change. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. I just want to comment on um, the work that you guys are doing because I think it's really amazing to you know reinvent the idea of what does a memorial mean today how do you get people to participate in that you know i really feel like a a memorial is is a is a visible part of history right so that you're making what could be overlooked like three plaques on a building into something that people stop and look at and think about and in and um you've woven it into the into the neighborhood fabric which i think is just amazing and also that they that it doesn't just exist in one place but that it understands that there are many places that need to be memorialized and and they i think both of the work uh, you know the work that both of you are doing does that quite beautifully so thank you for the work you did likewise <laughs> thank you everyone yep okay how about one more question <laughs> just because of the queen's connection natalie gets the last word before frankton it, it's funny that you asked that so um that project i was actually supposed to do in east harlem and i'm can you, talk louder? Oh. Can you hear me now yes oh, okay it's a little different sound uh so that that project was actually supposed to be in east harlem but i'm actually doing that 
now. And um, now with the Brownsville youth, I now have some a little bit more funding to continue the work, but to actually do more of the ritual or do something that's a bit more permanent with the ritual. So for instance, creating some kind of apparatus that does actually stays there and bap baptizes the space with water. Uh, we're also thinking about doing some community programming and actually doing an outdoor movie night in, the, in those spaces. Um, and I got in contact with a, a fellow that actually remembers the, the Pitkin uh, movie theater. And so we're gonna invite him to come through and you know, share those stories as well. So, so yeah, that, that'll be happening this summer. So hopefully there'll be some new videos to share later. Good. Thank you all and Frampton, back to you. Did we get like a photo up here or like? You know? Thank you all so much for being with us today and sticking with us for running a little bit long. And thank you so much again to our panelists. I hope we'll stick around if people have additional questions for them. Um, and as we mentioned in our email, the Taste of Tribeca is happening nearby if you're looking for lunch. I hear it's very crowded, even though it's raining. Um, and uh, with that, thank you again. We'll be, we've recorded today and this will be posted on our website. Um, so please um, take a look out for that and our tours coming up in the next month. Thank you again so much. Thank you.